So hello everybody, I'm Kelly Kenyon and I'm here at Spencertown Academy. I think everybody here except maybe one person is local so you know who we are. We're in beautiful Spencertown, New York and we are so pleased to have you with us today for this Family Arts Kaleidoscope presentation with Tom Lee. Heroes and Art in Greek Mythology. So Tom Lee has um, worked with us through Spencertown for the Chatham, Chatham School District doing Arts Voyage. And so he is a master of art mythology and art and storytelling. And I'm sure that we're all just going to have a really, really fun and exciting time today. So I am going to turn myself off. I'll be listening and um, paying attention, and I hope everybody here will also be paying attention, right? Great. Okay, okay thank, you, thank you, guys. Sure. And, but don't, uh, Kelly, we'll leave everybody on. Yeah, I'm going to leave everybody becomes, on. Unless it becomes too confusing. That's I'm totally still okay. kind of new to this. I only did a couple of these in the spring, and I know a lot of students are really used to these. Uh, but I, what I miss most, of course, being in the classroom is getting kids. I, it's weird how much I miss kids interrupting. I miss kids shouting out. You know, teachers are always saying, don't shout out, don't shout out. I kind of love the shouting out because when you really are thinking something and you're excited about it, you know, and you just want to say it. So uh, feel free to shout out. And if it starts to be a problem, then we'll figure it out. So Yehuda, do you know that we can't see you? Is that how you want it? Or hear you. Or hear you. So or what? something that says, turn on your microphone, Yehuda, Wiley, Sherry. I'm going to uh, ask, I'm asking them to unmute. Okay. Uh, All right. Okay. And this, by yeah. the way, is my beautiful new backyard for some of my uh, friends who are on. I'm, we moved from West Hartford to Bloomfield, and we have this woods now. So you might, mm -hmm. you might see a bear walk behind me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> probably not, but we do have a little bear in the neighborhood and uh, sometimes he makes an appearance. Okay. Oh, Tom, so excuse, wait, Tom, excuse me. Can I just yep. interject one little point? I just wanted to point out if anybody is not aware of this, if you want to make sure you see Tom big on your screen, make sure that you have put him in, put this, your screen in speaker view. If you're seeing a lot of different pictures of people, that means you're in gallery view. So on most people's screens that will be at the top of the screen, where you're t telling people, you're saying speaker view or gallery view. So just play with that until you see the person who's speaking big on your screen. And that's all I have to say. There we okay, go. Okay, great. Okay, so off we go. So this is a topic that I love yeah. and I, I don't think I've ever been to a school to talk about Greek mythology where kids are like, oh boy, so boring. Uh, people love it. People have always loved it. People have loved Greek myth for thousands of years. Um, and especially since uh, Percy Jackson came out, people sort of know even more than usual. I think I am the one person in America who has never read a Percy Jackson book. Um, I, <laughs> I just wanna do it my way. So Percy Jackson can do it his way. So let's take a look at this picture here. And this is where the sort of talking out or talking back is, is so important because I don't want to talk to you about this picture. I want you to talk to me about this picture. Take a look and I like to do what's called inventory where you just kind of look at the picture and how many details can you start to notice. So since we have the computer screen, I'm going to do some, some zooming in. Um, so we can look at the whole picture, but then I'm just going to do a couple little zoom ins on some details and uh, like that. So just notice what you notice. I like to say pay attention to what you're paying attention to. What catches your eye? What questions do you have? What do you instantly know when you see this? What do you see? It's like, oh, I know. Here's what I, I can tell you this and I can tell you that. But the more you look, usually the more you see. And the more you see, the more questions you start to have. What's going on? He doesn't look happy. Uh, 
So I like to do something that I call look, think, and sketch. So we've did, done a little bit of looking. People say that most people in the United States, when they go to museums, they look at paintings for how long do you think? 15 seconds. Yeah. 15 seconds. About that, yeah, about 10 or 15 seconds. And when I sit in museums, uh, I notice that people kind of walk and they look and they go to the next picture and they look and they go to the next picture. And you know, you can't look at every single picture in every single museum, but er every time I go to a museum, I make sure to look at at least one artwork for at least 20 minutes, at least 20 minutes to really, really look. So while we were looking and kind of poking in at some details, what are some things that people noticed? There's, What's going on here? What did you see? There seems to, I feel like there's a baby in the arms of the person standing. The arm of the person standing. Like, uh, and what did you see that gave you the idea that there was a baby there? A face. Okay. A face. Oh, okay. Good, good. Okay, so you're looking, you see my little arrow? Yeah. Okay, so you're looking at this face. Excellent. Uh, so anybody else have an observation? Um, I see the thing like behind that snake or whatever it is. Okay, so this creature, right? And then yeah, what's, that... what's behind it? What did you notice about that? It looks like a hand, but... Okay, it looks like a hand. What did you notice about it that made you think of a hand? Well, it does have like four fingers or something like that. Okay, we can have a zoom in on that. All right, cool, good. Somebody else? Yehuda, Wiley, still can't hear you. Oh, hi. Hello. Yeah, we're, we're sitting here. Uh, Paying rapt attention. Uh, okay. Well, what kind of what are you noticing as you look at this picture? I, I, I can't say that I see a hand. We, we see a ram. Okay. Look, a ram. What do you mean when you say a ram? I see the face. Uh, I think sort of a, a curved horn and sort of a pointy nose, and that looks like the back of an animal. Okay. So this could be an animal's horn and the nose. And this could be, not to put too fine a point on it, the animal's back end. Right. Good. Other questions or observations that we notice? What about this? Uh, I'm seeing a helmet on the person standing. OK, great. Good. Uh, the person standing, and I like that you're being very sort of neutral, right? You're just saying whoever that is, it's a person, and I'm talking about the one who's standing up. Good. That person's wearing a helmet. Excellent. And uh, any, any details about the helmet that you noticed? I'm seeing a, on it, I'm seeing kind of looks like a mythical creature or, some, or something like that. Okay. It doesn't look I, very... I keep real. scrolling back through my other pictures, but a mythical creature on the helmet. What did you notice about it? Looks like it has a human head, wings, and like a horse or lion or a cat, some sort okay, of- Okay, great. Good, good, good. Uh, the, the head looks, even in this tiny little detail, the head looks human, but it has wings for sure but it's got a tail that looks like some sort of cat or lion. Anybody want to take a guess? Even Jackie, I bet you know. <laughs> Abby, I bet you know. Wiley just put in the chat that it's a griffin. Oh, okay, excellent. Could be a griffin, that, that combination of uh, different animals. We know them from Harry Potter for sure. Uh, that's a sphinx, the character that's shown on that person's helmet uh, is the Sphinx. And the Sphinx was a monster, a little, I don't know, I think a little nastier than the Griffin. The Sphinx loved to ask riddles. 
And if you couldn't answer the riddle, uh, the Sphinx would devour you or kill you. I don't know if the, she ate you, but, um, and that's the same Sphinx that they have in Egypt. So who is this person with this? And we didn't talk about this guy at all. What's going on with him? Uh, well, I see that he's holding like a sword on the bottom or like whatever spear. that is. Yeah, spear. Oh, interesting. So you're looking at this shape? No, I think it's the one, the one that looks like it's going through the guy's head. No, oh, it's not that. <laughs> no, good. It's okay. like a little <clears throat> You search a little bit down. No. Like, right at the bottom at yeah, the very at the bottom. bottom oh okay so okay good so is he holding this or or is okay. this part of this yeah it's probably part of it it looks like it yeah good okay so the the person we've been talking about as the figure or the person um oh so let, but i want to talk for a second about what this is okay so we just looked at the picture but now, if we kind of zoom back a little bit, and you see where the picture is, what can you tell me about that? It's like some sort of bowl or a pan. That's okay, good. A bowl fine. or a pan. Excellent. Good. And it was, and this was painted by hand. This is actually a, a kind of a drinking cup. Uh, would have been a, a kind of a, I think, a sloppy way to drink, but. Um, the outside of the cup looks like this. Oh, it's big. And you can see the handles over here, right? And if I go back, are you gonna let me do that? No. Oh, okay. No. Now it's a funny sort of a cup because when you lift it up to your face to drink, can you see these things? They look like eyes. So if you lifted it up in front of your face to to drink, the eyes would be where your eyes are. And it would be really funny, I think, and everybody would laugh. Uh, but this <laughs> <laughs> is the common thing, because they weren't drinking milk out of these cups, I'll just tell you. Now, this is how you do not want your cup to look, OK? What happened here? It was broken. <laughs> this was broken, OK? So this cup is. 2,500 years old, okay? So this painting was painted 2,500 years ago. And if you look really carefully, you can see that actually this was broken. This was broken in hundreds of pieces uh, because let's face it, I mean, I, I can't keep a cup on my shelf for, three years probably without breaking the handle or chipping it or part of it. So if you think if, the, if this is 2,500 years old, right, it's going to get broken. Uh, so a lot of times when this stuff comes into a museum, it might look like that. When they dig it up, when archaeologists dig it up, it might look like that. But it's made from this. What are we looking at here? This is something you see all the time. It's a flower pot. It's a flower pot. And uh, does anybody know what material that's made of? Clay. It's made of clay, or we call it, um, we call it terracotta. And I have, I have one here. I have one here I made earlier. Um, this is just a regular clay pot. There's thousands of these. And this is mud. This is made out of mud that you put in the kiln and you bake it. And I know Miss Gribus is thinking, oh, 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 we did that. We did that when I was teaching at Chatham Elementary School, uh, and we made dragons out of clay. Um, but in ancient Greece, they made thousands and thousands of these clay pots, and we still have an incredible number of them today. It's kind of amazing. Oh, hello, Meredith. Thank you for joining us. Um, so whenever we're looking at clay pots from ancient Greece, it's kind of fun to remember that that's what they're made of. If you look at this one, this is a weird shape, but this is the only one I've ever seen that looks like this. Um, and this probably would have floated in a big pan of water because it has no base. If you put that down on a table, it would fall over. But if you put that in a big bowl of water, it would float and keep whatever was inside kind of cold. 
But if you look at the color here, see that background color? That's the same color of a, of a pot. If you went down to wards and bought a clay pot, flower pot, it would be almost that same color. And this is also terracotta. This is also like a flower pot. But what's different about this picture? It has a design on it. The design, okay, the design is very different, although actually they're both playing musical instruments. But what color is the person in this picture? Black or brown. Black or brown. And the background is the color of what? The person in the other pot. Okay, right. The person in the other picture is the same color. So this color, this orange color, is guess what? I'm trying to stop my share. It's this. That's not paint. Whenever you see that orange color on an old pot from ancient Greece, it's not paint. It's the color of the clay. So it's kind of cool, I think at least, that this here, right, this color is the pot, the terracotta. I have somebody in my house who says, tell them what terracotta means. If we were going to speak <laughs> Italiano, we would know that terracotta means baked earth or cooked earth. Because terra, terra is earth, and the pot is just mud. So when you see this guy, remember that that's not paint. Everything else is painted on the pot. Everything else is painted black. So two kinds of pots. This guy is called a black figure. And this guy is called a red figure. So whenever you're looking at a Greek pot, doesn't matter what museum you're in or what book you're looking in, it's always going to be either a red figure pot or a black figure pot. So it's kind of fun to notice the difference. All right. So this is the same person. This is Athena. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit today about the goddess Athena. This is a great big pot. And this was a prize. If you were a prize athlete and you won a race, you would have got a pot like this as your prize. And it would have been filled with olive oil. And what's kind of cool about this, we see a lot of the same things. She's got a helmet on her head. And she doesn't have that face, that face that someone thought was a baby face. But can you see what's on her shawl here? Snakes. Snakes. Yep. She's wearing this shawl that's covered in snakes. And you can also see that there's a, there are roosters here. And these are all clues. In ancient Greece, most people didn't know how to read or write. The person who made this pot probably didn't know how to read or write. Um, the people who made these pots, nowadays these pots are super valuable. They're worth millions and millions of dollars, some of them. But in ancient Greek times, they weren't really so valuable. They were sort of valuable, but they weren't worth, they weren't like spectacular works of art. They were, uh, they were containers. You use them for oil and water and wine. But this person actually wrote, so he did know how to write, and he wrote the word, uh, Athena, right here, Athena. And that's how you spell Athena in ancient Greece. And Athena is interesting because the city of Athens was named after Athena. And there's all kinds of stories about that. So let's talk a little bit about Athena. I'm going to switch over to me now. You just get me. Um, so long ago in ancient Greece, they believed in the goddess Athena and she was the daughter of Zeus. But her life was a very strange life because she was born in a very unusual way. She was born, anybody know? Anybody dying to say? You usually have like one smarty pants who knows all the answers and wants to say, I know, I know. It's not me. <laughs> You're a smarty pants in other situations. Um, she was born inside her father's head. 
her father was Zeus. Her father was the great god Zeus. And he was married to a woman named Metis. And Metis was going to have a baby. And Zeus thought, oh, wonderful. My wife is going to have a child. I love children. But then the future was predicted. And Zeus was told that someday his wife, the child that this wife had, would be more powerful than her father. And when Zeus heard that, he said, oh, no, uh, I do not want to have a child who's more powerful than I am. So he tricked Metis and he got her to change. Some people say he got her to change herself into a bug, into like a fly. And he said, are you really so powerful? Can you transform yourself into a fly? And Metis did. She transformed into a fly and Zeus said, oh, that's amazing. And when he said, oh, that's amazing, guess what happened? He swallowed his wife. He swallowed the fly, which was fine, except remember she was going to have a baby? Well, she did. And even though she was now inside of Zeus, the baby was born. And the baby was born inside of Zeus's head. How crazy is that? We love Greek mythology oh, oh. because the stories are crazy. And inside Zeus's head, this baby was born. And Athena was going to become uh, the goddess of many things. She was going to be the goddess of wisdom. And why do you think she would be the goddess of wisdom? Smart, she was oh, born inside her father's head. So she got all of Zeus's brain power even before she was born. So Athena is the goddess of wisdom, but she was also going to be the goddess of war. And if you're going to be one of the god, gods of war, if you're going to be a goddess of war, you need armor. So even in her father's brain, when she was just born, she started to create her own armor. And she had an, I don't know where she got an anvil in Zeus's brain. Don't ask questions like that. And she was hammering at her, at her armor. And Zeus had this incredible headache, this God-sized headache. And he said, someone get this child out of my brain. And his son Hephaestus, who was the god of blacksmiths, uh, he had a great big axe and he chopped Zeus's head. Now it's important to remember that Zeus was a god, so he could never do what? Die. He could never die. So even when they cut open his head, his daughter just sprang right out of his head and she was fully ready to go. She was ready for action. And sometimes you hear people today, they say, oh, this idea just came out of my head all at once. It was all ready to go. And that's how Athena was born. And but believe it or not, I have a picture of that. I'm gonna go back to these in a second. But there she is. <laughs> Again, don't forget, this is 2,500 years old. But this is Zeus and he's wearing his crown of leaves. And this is sort of his scepter. It should really be a thunderbolt, but this artist chose to put him with a scepter. And uh, there's Athena and she's popping out of his head. She's already wearing her famous helmet. You can see that helmet is the same helmet that she's wearing here. She's almost always shown wearing that helmet. And um, this is Hephaestus. He's got his ax and he's like, whoa, that's amazing. This is the goddess of childbirth. In ancient Greece, there was a god or a goddess for everything. And this goddess, she usually came when women were gonna have babies. The goddess of childbirth would come and she'd say, I'll help you. Can you tell what Zeus is saying to her? Go away. I don't need any help. I'm Zeus and I can have this baby all by myself. Men. They haven't changed in 2,500 years. <laughs> so what I want to ask you to do is to, did everybody have a piece of paper and a pencil? Yeah. Let's take, good, excellent. So let's just take a couple of minutes. And again, I, this is something I haven't done online. It's so easy to do this in class, but uh, let's just take a couple of minutes and I want you to sketch this goddess that you see on the screen. And I'll just be quiet for about, let's say two minutes or so. 
because, and it's really important to do this, even if you're thinking, oh, I don't want to sketch. It's really important to do it because the more you look, the more you see. And if you make a sketch, it really helps you notice the details. So I'm going to scroll back just for a second through some of these details that we showed before. Did I? Oh, no, I didn't. Sorry. There we go. Let's look at that for just a second. And then go back to that. It's funny to watch your step online. We'll just go another few little bit. Then I want to find out if what you were thinking, what were you noticing while you were sketching. In fact, you can keep sketching if you want, but if people want to share, like, what did you notice? Was there anything that you noticed more when you were sketching it than when we were just looking at it on the screen? Go ahead. I saw it at the bottom of the skirt, it kind of looks like, like if there was like something that was going to be planted or something. Say that one more time. At the bottom of the dress, it looks like a field or something. Oh, okay. The bottom of her dress. Let's see if I can get my little arrow to show up. Yeah, so down here, interesting, because we can see this part of her dress. What's going on there? What's what's your name, the person who just spoke? What's your name? Rose. Rose. So what's going on with the bottom of her dress? What did you notice? What's going on here? Um, what kind of line is that? Like curves. Like okay, it's good. Okay, it's a very curvy line. And then this is sort of different, right? This part, the bottom of her dress. So this is like the front of her dress, and then these are her legs, and this is the back of her dress. So what's the front part of her dress? What's it doing? Curving. It's curving, right? She's walking along, and she means business. I mean, she's got her spear up in the air, so she's not like out walking in the park. She's kind of marching along. So what would happen to your dress? If you were wearing a dress like that and you were marching along, what would your dress do? Rip. Say again. It, it would. It would like. Did you say it might rip? Yeah. Yeah, it might. It might rip. Yeah. What else could your dress do if you were marching in a dress? Um, My dress would get dirty. <laughs> it might get dirty. Okay, good. Except, I except. A lot of times, gods and goddesses, their clothes didn't get dirty. That was a way you could tell if someone was a god or a goddess in disguise. This turns up in a lot of myths, uh, that if they, were, if they came walking along and their clothes were like impeccable, they walked 10 miles on a dusty road, but their clothes weren't dirty, that meant it was probably a god or a goddess in disguise. Good. I'm thinking about the way clothes will 
kind of flap and flow and move. You know, if I ran along in this jacket, right? It might look at the way my look at the way my sleeve is now. See how it's all kind of wrinkled and when I move my arm. So her her dress is kind of flowing and moving. What other observations did anybody come up with? It looks like on her armor, it kind of looks like scales. Oh, like on her tile. Okay, cool. On her torso armor. Okay, cool. That's not, that actually isn't armor, although it's, it's, it's better than armor. When Zeus was born, he had an enemy and his enemy was his father. Zeus's father was Kronos and Kronos had heard the same thing that Zeus heard. This turns up in Greek mythology again and again and again. The God is going to have a child, but the child is going to be more powerful than his father. And when God's heard this, it was always trouble. And when Kronos heard that his children were going to be more powerful than he was, you know what he did? What? Yes, he swallowed them. <laughs> he did. Every time his wife had a baby, she said, oh, look, a little baby goddess. And he'd say, oh, that's adorable. Oh, oh. Now I don't have to worry about it. Now I don't have to worry that that child is going to be more powerful than me. And he swallowed five of his children. And his poor wife, uh, Rhea, she was so upset. She didn't know what to do. And she went home to her mother. And her mother was Gaia, Mother Earth. And Mother Earth said, you're going to have one more child, but we're going to hide this baby. I, Mother Earth, am going to make a secret cave that Kronos does not know about. And as soon as the baby is born, I want you to hide the baby inside that cave. And she did. She had another baby, and the baby was Zeus. And she ran with the baby and she put it in this cave. And she was a little worried because the baby wouldn't have any food. But Mother Earth had left a goat in the cave. And Zeus, this tiny little baby, he sort of curled up next to the goat and he drank the milk from the goat. And even though the baby cried, Mother Earth put monsters outside of the cave and the monsters would screech and scream and uh, they covered up the sound. So Kronos never heard the baby Zeus crying and baby Zeus never went hungry because he was drinking the milk of the goat. The goat's name was Althea. I think we had a girl in um, Chatham Elementary School a couple years ago. Her name was Althea. Uh, and her, she's, I don't know if she was named after this goat, but it's the same name. And, um, and then when Zeus grew up and he went and he rescued his brothers and sisters, he got them out of his father's belly gross again greek mythology is gross and uh, they all took over zeus and his brothers and sisters took over the universe but the goat was so near and dear to to zeus even when he was the great god the goat eventually died uh it grew old and died but he took the skin of the goat and he made it into this sort of what's called a peplos and athena's wearing this armor and it's the goat skin uh, that Zeus gave her. But it also has all these snakes attached to it. Does anybody know where Athena was going to get a hold of a bunch of snakes like that? And it goes back to the very first picture that we saw that someone thought was a baby. Sometimes when you see Athena, you see this head right here. Not the whole body, just the head. That's the head of everybody's favorite. Anybody know? Go ahead, say if you know. Medusa. Medusa. When Perseus had to chop off Medusa's head, it was almost impossible to do by himself. But Athena helped him. And chopping off the head of Medusa. Medusa was, Medusa was once very beautiful. But actually, why don't I? Uh, okay, I think some of you are still sketching. Medusa was once very beautiful. Uh, she was a lovely goddess, but uh, she got Aphrodite angry at her, which you never want to do. And Aphrodite cursed her and made her hideously ugly and turned her hair to snakes. 
And whenever Medusa looked at a human being, she was so horrifying to see that they turned to stone. And Perseus had to go and chop off Medusa's head. And if you think about it, that's a very difficult thing to do because as soon as you look at her, you're gonna to turn to stone. So Athena helped Perseus out and she gave him her shield, which was as bright as a mirror. And she told him to look in the shield. So when he looked at the reflection of Medusa, he could chop off her head without looking at her. And he was so grateful that he gave her Medusa's head, thanks a lot. And uh, she would wear it on her peplos, on her armor. And uh, the snakes are there on the fringe of the armor to show Athena's power. Anything else? It looks like I can, it's so funny to watch your faces looking at the screen while you're sketching. It looks like you're really sketching in detail. Any other observations? Any other things people are noticing while they're sketching? Nah, it's like, nah, I got it. I'm good. All right, let's keep going. Let's look at a couple of other things. Oh, wait. Go I, ahead. Yeah. I, what do those other words mean on the uh, side? That's the name of the, that's the name of the painter. I can't, I can't remember. Anicolon, I think was his name. Uh, some of the painters of these pots, and, and we say Greek vases, but they're really not vases for flower pots. Uh, vases that you'll put flowers in there. Um, they're usually jugs or containers. Let's call them containers. But some of the painters were really pretty famous. If you competed in the Greek Olympics, uh, if you were a great runner, I said that you would get one of these as a prize. So it was sort of a very special thing. So he signed, he said uh, uh, Athena's name, and then he signed his own name on the pot. Athena always wears earrings, which I think is kind of charming. You never want to be underdressed when you go to war. And she has this necklace as well. And I just, this is kind of beautiful. Whenever you see these pots, you'll see that they're always decorated around the rim. What can you tell me about this design? What type of design is that? What do you notice about it? Symmetrical. Yeah, what? Symmetrical? Yes, exactly. It's symmetrical. But if you've ever tried to do this and make it come out even, you had to be sure, you had to know your dimensions of your pot because once you started doing it and you went all the way around the pot, you had to make sure when you got to the last one that it met right up with that one, which is trickier than you think. So there she is again. All right. And that's the whole pot. This is called an amphora. And it's got two handles to carry. It would have been very heavy if it was filled with wine or water. Okay. So here's another pot. Is this black figure or is this red figure pottery? Let's say that's right. This is black. This yeah. is the background. The background is the color of the clay, and the characters are painted in black. And this would be painted on, I don't know if you did it in art class, but it would be painted on the pot uh, before it went into the kiln to get baked on. And, uh, and the, the paint is, is permanently attached. So who can tell me who this guy is? Zeus? Do you remember who he said? Kim? Good guess. Could be Zeus. Oh, no. Oh, whatever no, that's What's he, yeah, like, what's he doing? What's going on? He looks like he's killing the snake. Okay, he's killing a snake. <laughs> and what do you notice? I like Rose. Rose is not being shy. What do you notice about this particular snake? So it looks like it's all coming from one. Right. One body, right? Here's the body of the snake. How many heads? One. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. This snake has nine heads. This is the Hydra. And this is Heracles. And Heracles was, of course, amazingly strong. He's sort of everybody's favorite hero. And Heracles had 12 impossible tasks 
that he had to complete a uh, long, complicated story. Hera hated Heracles, uh, Zeus's wife, Hera. She really hated him. Yeah. And she tried everything she could do to uh, get him to die. To, she didn't want to kill him, but she, she put him in all these dangerous situations. Um, he was Zeus's son, but Zeus had another wife beside Hera. Zeus had a lot of wives, long story, different day. But um, Hera, she was so angry that Zeus had another wife that she was angry at this little baby. And when he grew up, she tried to destroy him. But because he was Zeus's son, uh, he was super, super powerful. He was human. He was not immortal, but he had the strength of a god. And among the tasks that he had to do was to kill this nine-headed snake, which might not be so hard, but there was also this horrible crab that lived with the snake. And if you can see, it's sort of pinching his feet. So while he was trying to kill the snake, this crab came to attack him. And who knows the trick that this snake had? If you chopped off one of its heads, two grew back in its place. So you might start with nine heads, but then you chop off one of the nine heads, and then you've got 10 heads. And then you chop off one of those, and you've got 11 heads. And it, it's like, sometimes problems are like that. My garden is like that. I pull up one weed, and then there's two weeds where the one weed was. Sometimes problems can be like that. They can just get worse and worse when they should be getting better and better. But he had his nephew with him, Elias, and they sort of cheated a little bit. Elias has this fire here and he took this knife and he put the knife in the fire. And when they cut off one of the snake's heads, uh, the knife was so hot that it burned the snake's neck and it couldn't grow back a new head. So kind of cheating. They had to actually do an extra task because they sort of cheated at this one. But this is one of the most famous stories from Greek mythology. And this is the whole pot. And you can start to see, again, we've got decorations on the top, the story in the middle, and then on the bottom. But this Heracles is a funny Heracles. He's not really dressed the right way. Heracles is always, whenever you see a Greek artwork, statue, painting, pot, you're gonna see Heracles dressed like this. What's he wearing here? Can you tell? Looks like some squirt sort of skin. Yeah, he's wearing the skin of a lion. Oh. He's always, whenever you see Heracles, he's dressed in a lion's skin. The first labor, the first task that he had to do was to kill the Nemean lion. And the Nemean lion was super, super strong, but even more important, the skin of the lion was impenetrable. What does impenetrable mean? Go ahead. And hurt it or kill it. Impenetrable means you can't cut it. You can't cut into it. So he took a spear and he stabbed the Nemean lion, but he couldn't get through the skin. And he took his ax and he chopped it, but he couldn't chop the skin. So finally, you can even see what he's doing here. How did he finally kill the Nemean lion? Chokehold. Exactly. He strangled it. Oh, chokehold. That's a new meaning to that word these days. But yes, he strangled the Nemean lion. And um, then he had to take the skin off. That was part of the job. But wait a minute. The skin is impenetrable. So he did something very clever. He took the lion's claws and he used the lion's own claws to cut the skin off of the lion's body. Again, gross, but cool. That's Greek mythology, boys and girls. Look at this at the bottom. You see the shape? Take a minute, take a minute and just draw this shape. This is very, very famous. Just take your pencil and sketch this line. 
and then this line. I'll do that again. This. And then this. That's called a Greek key. And you can see that it goes all the way across this pot. That turns up a lot, a lot, a lot in ancient Greek art, the Greek key. That's the whole pot. And is this black figure or red figure? Go ahead. Red. Yeah, it's a red figure pot. Which would, I, you know, which do you think would be easier to do? This is another one, and he's killing the Stymphalian birds. These were these horrible birds that uh, their feathers were like razors, and their feathers would drop off, and they could cut you, and they would attack very vicious birds. And he used this sort of um, slingshot, sort of a combination of a slingshot and these noisy castanets. You don't see them here but he scared the birds up into the air and then he slung his slingshot at them and he was able to destroy them. And that's that whole pot. So let's just take a minute. Anybody have any questions? Anything you're wondering about, curious about, anything you heard or saw so far? I love questions. A lot of people are uh, muted, so now's oh, okay. the time. Now's the time to unmute yourself, guys. If Don't you be shy, like. unmute. Yeah, please, please unmute yourself. I was muting a few people as trying to reduce the background noise, but open it up, guys. What were the pots made at significant different points in time, like thousands of years apart? Oh, or, what a good question. Listen. I'm so embarrassed. I should remember your name and I can't. Paxton. What is it? Paxton. Paxton, of course it is, like Tom Paxton. All this time I've been pretending I didn't forget it, but now I have to say I forgot. <laughs> okay, so great question, Paxton. Um, there was a time, so the pots were made for about four or 400 years or so. Athens was super powerful, super rich. They, you know, when a, when a culture gets a lot of money, when things are really going well, people have time for art. And when people have time for art, it's like, I don't need to go work on my farm right now. I'm going to go learn how to make pots instead. Someone else can make the wheat and make the bread, and I can spend time making my artworks. So the more a culture is sort of successful when everybody has a job and everybody has food and they don't have to worry about those things, then they can do art. So Athens went into this period where more and more people could do more and more things like that. So it's around 500 BC. The older pots, they're, not, they're just not as pretty. They're more like, we need a pot, so we'll put some designs on it. Some of them are nice, but a pot that's like, from 600 BC, you can, uh, you can always tell. It's like, oh, that's nice, but it's not like amazingly nice. So around 450 BC, that was when the pots, every pot you see has incredible artistry, incredible detail. And then after that, there was a big war uh, with, with the Persians and things got really difficult and there wasn't a lot of time and money for people to make pots. So the pots after that aren't as nice. So there's this time that we call the golden age of Greek art. And it's around from around 500 BC to around 400 BC. So that's a great question. Any other questions? I got one more picture I'm gonna show you, but anything else, anything you wanna say or notice or question? No, okay, all right. I'll ask one, Mr. Lee. Go ahead. Thank you, Ms. Brownell. Well, I just think it's really fascinating that they have so much storytelling on pots. Are there other cultures that have done similar things like that? Yes. Yes. But what's, it's fascinating, but it, they had not only two things. They had great stories and they had great illustrators. That this was a culture that said, my boy, I want you to grow up and be a pot painter, right? That was, a, that was considered to be a really great job. So they had a lot of good artists and they had a lot of good stories. And they had a lot of these pots. There were, there were thousands of these pots. And don't forget, they had uh, 
olive oil in Athens and they didn't have it in a lot of other places. And that's how one of the ways they made their money. People all over the world loved Greek olives and Greek olive oil, and they needed pots to put them in. So they made these pots and they sent them all over the world. You can find Greek pots in Italy, you can find Greek pots in Romania, but they were all starting from Greece. But so most of the people uh, did not know how to read or how to write. This would, it would have been very unusual we have writing from ancient Greece, but it was a small, small percentage of people that knew how to read and write. But everybody knew how to look at a picture and everybody knew the stories. When you were growing up, when you were a little kid, your mother and father would have told you about Hercules. Someday, maybe you'll grow up to be like Hercules or maybe you will be like Athena, my daughter, and maybe you'll be this great noble uh, young woman and you will go and worship Athena. And they would have had pots. So, I mean, I actually have, um, like this is something that we have in, in our house. I don't know if you can see it, but um, this is painted by hand. This is not super old. This is about 50 years old. I got a B. And uh, this is made of the same stuff. This is terracotta and it's painted by hand. It's not super, super expensive, you know, but it costs a little bit more because someone took the trouble to paint it by hand. Um, this is another example um, of hand painted pottery. And I like this because it's a little bit messy. You can sort of see it's sort of sloppy. And um, again, if I was to break this, which miraculously I have not yet done, it would look exactly the same as a, as a flower pot, same material. That, that drawing you said you liked because it was messy. Yep. Was it a wheat, like a, picture of the top of a wheat or what did it kind of look like a tree? Is it, that looks like wheat? Yeah, it, it's just, you know what, it's called a fleuron. It's just a decoration, okay. but it does have, it's a good observation Paxson because it has what's called a botanical sort of design. So a lot of plants grow in that way. So it's just, it's just sort of based on some kind of plant. But let's look at one more thing because I have a craft for you. Um, is that showing you that? Okay, good. So whenever I work in museums, I, there's always someone else to do the craft. And Ms. Gribus always would do the craft when I would come to schools. But I wanted you to have a craft. So this is a, a little pot and there were thousands of cups like this. This would be a really standard thing to have. And it's an owl and the owl is sacred to Athena. So this is a cup that you would have had your milk out of or wine out of, but you would have sort of thought about Athena when you were drinking out of this cup, because there she is. And uh, what I did is I made a pattern that I just put it into black and white, and you're gonna get a little packet of some of these pictures, and you're gonna get a packet like this. And then I made a pot. Ooh. So I just took a That's regular old cool. flower pot that actually did come from wards, this pot. And, um, and then I just looked at that design and I liked it because it was pretty simple to do. And I just used regular old temper paint and a brush. I, th I thought about it afterwards. I won't be able to put it, this outside because it'll get washed off. But I thought it was a fun, easy pattern to do. So I would absolutely love it if you guys wanted to try to make a red figure pot out of a flower pot. You could do this design or you could make up your own design. So that was my, that was my clever plan. And if you do, here's what we would love. Spencer Town Academy would love it. If you did some drawings or sketches while we were talking, take a picture with your phone and uh, send them to Spencer Town Academy. We'd really, really love to see them. And if you make a pot, you know, please. Make, take a picture of that and send it to us. Yes, please. Yeah, do do that, guys. Send us a picture. Yeah, would you be putting them on like the website? I'm just, <laughs> Susan, are you biting your tongue? I just, <laughs> no, I just no, imagine no. crafts, crafts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, I any love thoughts, it. I love any it. thoughts about how you would, uh, I kept saying to myself, now what would Miss Gribus be telling the boys and girls to do if she was having them? Yeah. Yeah, we would have. Um, 
the only thing I would change is um, you could maybe use a Sharpie for oh, small okay. details oh. or, or black acrylic paint and then it won't wash off because you can't put that outside because the rain will change I it. hadn't thought about a Sharpie. That, actually, that would be great because you'd be able to control yeah. it more. I don't know if Sharpie spreads or bleeds a little bit, but a Sharpie could work. We could any, experiment with Any that. color marker, for that matter. Um, but uh, black acrylic paint definitely could be cool. Yep. Okay, great. Very good, Tom. That yeah, was good. Nice job. Nice pop. Thanks, everybody. That was a nice lot of fun. Job. Yeah, that's really wonderful. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, I we will be sending you, Tom is going to send me the packet, and we're going to be sending out the packet with that pattern. Some materials. You should, ha Tom. You should have that already, just FYI. Yes. Oh, did you do that already? I sent okay. it this morning. Oh, okay. All right. So fine. I do my best Thank work you. at yes. 5 a.m. <laughs> yes. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I'm going to just try and, oh, I did want to make the point that uh, Tom at TomLeeStoryteller.com has net. some, dot dot, excuse me, I'm sorry, TomLeeStoryteller.net has some wonderful other presentations right up there for you to see. So just you can just so much fun, so much great material. I totally recommend going to that site. Um, I'm going to try and do a quick screen share, just um, talking about what's going to be coming up next with Family Arts Kaleidoscope. Let me see if I can find that and share it. Like I say, it's just the internet. I don't know if you can see this, guys, yep. but this is on uh, August 22nd. We're going to be hosting Elena Mosley, who's going to do an African-American dance class um, online. And you'll be, you should be getting a notice if you don't get our e-blast already from Spencertown Academy. I hope that you will tell us um, so that we can send you this information. So back to you, Tom. I just really want to thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. And I well, want to thank blast. everybody here and everybody okay. here. You guys were so great. Thank you. I'm clapping. All right. So you guys uh, help me. I may be doing more of these in the school year. Who knows? I've been thinking okay. about Ms. Brownell. Ms. Brownell says August is the longest Sunday afternoon in the year. And it's like... Even more so this year, Tom. Even more so. <laughs> yes. Even more so, indeed. All right. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to click this button that says leave. Yes. Thank Goodbye. you. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Thank, Thank you again. You. Thank you.